Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's session. My name is uh, Katalin Vasile, and uh, today we're going to talk about bringing AI on device and all the tools and strategies available for moving AI away from the cloud and as close as possible to our end users. Quick disclosure before we start. Uh, the views I'm expressing today here are entirely my own and do not represent the opinions and policies of my employer. And a little bit about myself. I'm a product manager at Adobe. I recently transitioned into a management role after spending a lot of time working as a software engineer. A long time ago, I even uh, founded and led my own company. And that gave me enough experience in uh, entrepreneurship, which I still apply uh, today. Afterwards, throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to wear many hats. I've worked on consulting with various companies, uh, and I helped them build, scale, and uh, secure their technology. And for the past five years at Adobe, I focused on engineering, being part of the team that drives uh, features for securing Adobe services, and ensuring that uh, our systems stay reliable and secure. In our team, we manage and secure large-scale cloud infrastructure, leveraging cloud-native open source technologies for container orchestration, uh, networking, security, observability, and so on. Recently, I took a bold step into management. Uh, this new role allows me to leverage my technical background while also focusing on uh, leadership, and it's a very exciting change in my career. You know, after spending decades working on software engineering, I find myself balancing between uh, technical work and uh, being in back-to-back uh, -back meetings discussing strategies and leadership. It's a fun uh, change. But beyond my day job, I continue to work on uh, side projects. I continue to be passionate about engineering in general. And uh, I like sharing my knowledge as others have shared it and helped me in the past. Uh, in my free time, I enjoy working on projects that I find interesting. And uh, this brings to today's presentation where we explore a subject that I'm interested in. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here today with you. Thank you for uh, inviting me, especially in a city that I like most. So thank you. Today, we're going to tackle AI adoption head-on. We're driving into real-world applications and impactful use cases for running AI on device and or at the edge. When I mention the edge, I'm referring to software that controls hardware to handle specific tasks. And I'll use edge and on device interchangeably in the presentation. We'll break down how AI on device stacks up against running AI inference in the cloud, highlighting key differences and uh, uh, advantages for both scenarios. We'll also cover the most popular on device AI frameworks with a sharp focus on smartphones on, and mobiles, but we'll cover other frameworks as well. And finally, I've prepared some demos on mobile devices, uh, all of which I'll make available afterwards. Uh, in GitHub repositories for you to explore further. So if you're here today, chances are you've been exploring AI casually or are deep into uh, working with language models or perhaps diffusion models. Maybe you're curious, maybe you've integrated them into your daily tasks, or you might have uh, been a seasoned machine learning engineer or researcher. In my own work, I use I train models, I fine tune them, and I use them in order to boost my productivity overall. Uh, they're not just powerful, they're practical, and they're incredibly useful. And the numbers back this up. AI adoption has grown uh, very fast. In 2023, there have been around 255 million people using AI in one way or another. And by 2024, we have 314 million uh, people using AI. That's a 23.4% increase over time, and the year is not over yet. And uh, this growth will continue to uh, expand in the future years uh, as AI will be begin to 
uh, be part of our lives even more. <laughs> and it's not just changing industries, it's also changing how we handle everyday tasks, and it's making people more productive, uh, both in personal lives but in business ideas as well. We've seen AI changing industries across the board, uh, including in real world applications. First we have education. AI is changing how we learn by personalizing lessons, creating, uh, pla uh, enabling developers to create platforms that tailor to each student's needs. And they can also adapt based on the current progress of the uh, learning experience. Next, we have healthcare. This is a personal field of mine that I enjoy very much to keep up with. AI is advancing diagnostics and monitoring in the healthcare field as well, particularly in early disease uh, detection and patient care. For instance, we have uh, wearable health monitors that now track vital signs in real time, alerting doctors how uh, potential issues uh, came up before uh, they escalate. And next we have consumer electronics. We have devices that we use on our, on our daily basis, uh, making them smarter and helping us become productive on uh, each day. <laughs> Security features are also uh, powered by AI with facial recognition. We have fingerprint sensors enhancing our devices. And AI also boosts camera features like improving photographies and uh, image quality overall. We've also got digital bodies like uh, you, you're familiar with all of them that manage and handle our schedules and uh, create even personalized suggestions. So for example, I recently rewatched Akira before coming to Tokyo. Do you guys know Akira? It's uh, this classic 1988 anime film, and uh, it's set in a dystopian now Tokyo. And afterwards, when I came here, I was checking out the Maps application, and it started to recommend me uh, manga shops in Akihabara. So that's real fun without even mentioning it. Now, the next sector that's really interesting for me is automotive. Self-driving cars are no longer a futuristic concept. We have leading companies worldwide implementing self-driving cars in major cities, and uh, these are helping reducing danger on the road, but also uh, reducing human error. <clears throat> and AI systems not only assist with uh, self-driving, but also with uh, obstacle detection, blind spot monitoring, and parking support. And these advancements steadily paving the way for fully autonomous devices in more places. Let's just not uh, hope that uh, Akira and uh, Neo Tokyo is on the horizon very soon. <coughs> so the first uh, use case, as example, we have Apple's Face ID. When you unlock the device, you have facial recognition. AI makes this possible. Uh, for example, Face ID uses 3D imaging to project 30,000 dots on uh, everyone's face, and it's using those dots to compare using uh, ML models whether the scan matches your actual face. And uh, Apple suggests that it's a chance of one in a million to fool uh, Face ID. Next up, we have wearable devices like the Apple Watch, which also use on-device AI to monitor your heart rate and detect irregularities, such as atrial fibrillation. The Apple Watch can even perform ECG. Uh, this is a similar to a single-led ECG used in medical settings. With the latest models, from my understanding, uh, you can take an ECG without needing a prescription as well. So the Apple Watch is remarkably accurate in detecting heart rate rhythms. And in trials with around 600 participants, it accurately detected 99.6% uh, of the time atrial fibrillation and 98.3% of the time um, um, sinus rhythms, making it a very good uh, tool for uh, detecting heart rate issues. We also have new technology like the Butterfly IQ. Uh, it's advancing on device AI even further. This handheld ultra ultrasound scanner connects directly to a smartphone, and you can take it into remote areas to perform various imaging uh, on patients and provide insightful data. 
unlike traditional bulky ultrasound devices, uh, it's very mobile and um, it, it takes the, the scanner right at point of care where it's actually needed, even in remote locations. And imaging tools like auto bladder volume capture, auto beeline, and needle vis are making calculation uh, using AI real uh, accurate, and it's helping healthcare providers providing quick and accurate measurements. These tools uh, capture the data in real time, and they're helping doctors and clinicians uh, with complex procedures, enhancing the decision making in real time. We also have automotive, as mentioned earlier. <coughs> AI on device continues to change the game and innovate, especially for self-driving cars where real-time decision-making is important and sensor fusion are, are cru crucial. There are companies that have already launched AVs in major cities and should just show off how far we've come. And additionally, major car manufacturers all over the world are leveraging on device AI to make cars more secure and reliable. Uh, features like lane keeping assistance, uh, adaptive cruise control, and collision detection all rely on AI to make uh, processing directly on the vehicle. Uh, and of course, I know we have a lot of folks here from some of those companies here today. Uh, it's been really great to meet you. And it's been re I'm really excited to see the amazing work that you are doing and how far we're pushing the technology. So let's talk about AI on cloud, how it works. The traditional method of handling AI inferencing in cloud is that your request travels from your device through the internet being authorized at the application level, and then it's fetching any necessary data about yourself or the state that your persona is in the cloud, and then using an inference engine in hand, it handles using high power GPUs, it handles the inference and returns the result back to you. There are a couple of advantages with this approach. First, we have security. So data in the models are safeguarded uh, within the cloud infrastructure, provided uh, that you, only you have access to that data. And it remains strictly under your control. We also have performance. High power GPUs can help us process complex computations really fast, especially when using them in a distributed way or we have and leverage caching systems. We also have access to the latest models. Users always have access to the latest models uh, depending on when you decide to roll out the new update without having to, cons to be concerned about uh, managing windows of updates or keeping in exact sync with the users. But we also have these advantages as well. First, we have rising cloud costs. Running AI workloads in the cloud can quickly become <clears throat> very expensive, especially with uh, large scale usages. With high compute demands and large da data volumes, the cost of processing and data transfer goes uh, to extreme lengths. We also have dependency on an internet connection. We need an active internet connection in order for this setup to work. Uh, without internet access, uh, users will not be able to execute inference requests on their device. <clears throat> and finally, we have latency. There may be delays since the request and response must travel across the internet, which can affect the usability overall and the user experience. And by understanding these pros and cons, we can identify opportunities to improve making AI more, more efficient and accessible to our users. So when we run AI on device, uh, the, a, the inference, we can also train, but primarily the inference uh, runs directly on device. We cut out the extra communication layer needed typically for cloud processing. And this shift has made the uh, possible by the ongoing advances in both hardware and software optimizations, which are pushing the boundaries of what's achievable on device. Today, we have a range of increasing, increasingly powerful chips that are capable of handling AI tasks, uh, like facial recognition, object detection, and language uh, um, <clears throat> processing. Um, these chips can also deliver uh, 
faster speeds with, with less power, allowing us to perform these tasks locally without relying on an internet connection. And this approach has several key advantages. First, we have cost savings. By reducing or even eliminating the need for uh, uh, data center resources, we can save significantly on operational costs. Sometimes those are actually free. Often functionality. Devices can operate independently of an internet connection, making them more uh, versatile. And privacy and security, since uh, keeping data on device means sensitive information isn't transmitted, reducing exposure risks. However, this method also presents some challenges. First, we have limited processing power, and uh, devices don't have access to the same computational capacity as cloud servers, so they must work within the hardware limitations. We also have storage constraints. AI models are typically large and require significant storage and processing power, which can be challenging uh, for certain devices. And limited access to data. On-device processing means that devices may not have access to the vast data sets available uh, in the cloud. The good, the good news is that uh, ongoing innovations in hardware and software are, are actively targeting these challenges. On the hardware side, devices are getting more powerful. And on the software side, techniques like model distillation and pruning are reducing the size of models uh, while maintaining their effectiveness. We have challenges when de uh, deploying software on the edge or IoT devices, uh, especially when it comes to running AI inference. We have complex development, development that uh, relies on a variety of development languages used for edge devices, adds comp complexity, and the developers need to manage multiple programming environments. If it's embedded, it's even more complex. It's probably C, and the code isn't easily portable between platforms. We also have limited memory isolation. Microcontrollers uh, typically lack memory isolation. We have uh, debugging and development more difficult in this regard. We also have restrictions. Once shipped, the functionality stays the same. On some devices, it can be changed, making security updates and vulnerability fixes quite challenging. And there is also no support for multi-user, limiting the flexibility in development and deployment. And many devices don't even support dynamic loading, so updates require full recompilation. Most of these challenges can be overcome by using WebAssembly or WASM. WASM was introduced initially in 2017 and is now supported by all major web browsers. It was initially designed to support high-performance applications, uh, allowing developers to write code in languages like C++ and then write it, uh, run it directly in the web browser. However, in, in time, its capabilities have changed a lot, and it, it expanded beyond its initial scope. And developers are now using WebAssembly uh, for edge computing or even cloud deployments as well, bringing its efficiency uh, and portability to other environments. For example, we have CDNs like Cloudflare and Fastly, which support running WebAssembly closer to the edge. And the tiny runtimes run like uh, WebAssembly micro runtime or proprietary runtimes that provide very small footprints uh, in terms of resource usage uh, at very low power, uh, <coughs> which can be set up even for cloud native or IoT devices. Some uh, WASM runtimes even provide support for extended features, such as async processing, uh, PyTorch inference, or TensorFlow inference, database connectors if they're needed, and even more. WebAssembly supports uh, various programming language, languages, including C, C++, C Sharp, Rust, Go, and JavaScript. Um, and the way it works is that you write code once, you compile it into a WebAssembly binary or module, which are essentially pure functions by definition, and you host those binaries in a runtime. The beauty of this approach is that the code runs within a secure and sandboxed environment, and it's ensuring it's isolated from the host system uh, for enhanced security. And today we're lucky to have with us some of the key developers and maintainers of these tools from various companies. 
I'm uh, looking forward to their sessions, to review them, and uh, to explore in more detail how these powerful uh, technologies can be leveraged. But for now, let's zoom out a little bit and focus on the larger picture and continue by taking a closer look at mobile frameworks. Moving on to mobile frameworks, we have two major players in the field. We have Apple's core machine learning and Google AI on the edge. These frameworks are develop, developed to bring powerful AI capabilities directly on mobile devices. I'll show you soon exactly how it's like for an application developer to work with some of these tools. Core machine learning is a framework that supports a range uh, of applications, including vision, natural uh, language, and speech, as well as sound analysis, and allows developers to integrate machine learning models directly into their applications. It provides a unified structure for managing uh, different models, enabling apps to use APIs and user data to make predictions, and uh, to also train and fine tune models, even though that's pretty much uh, an edge case. And the framework is built on low level proprietary uh, uh, frameworks and it optimizes performance by using the device's CPU, GPU, or neural engine. And while exploring core machine learning, I implemented an example using the DETR model or detection transformer. It's uh, an advanced object detection model that uh, uses an encoder decoder transformer architecture. And um, it, with, it's using also a convolutional backbone. And the model has two heads uh, added on top of the decoder outputs. One linear layer for predicting class labels and an MLP for determining bounding boxes. And the model uses object, model, uh, object queries. <coughs> uh, each is designed to search for uh, specific objects in an image. And DETR can also be extended for uh, panoptic segmentation uh, by adding a, a mask head. There's also an improved version of DETR, which is called Hyper DETR. It addresses some of the performance bottlenecks that DETR has by default, and it's even more performant on uh, mobile devices. And the first step <coughs> uh, when uh, using Core ML is to instantiate the model using the seamless API and the post processor. This is how it looks in code. It's quite simple and straightforward. It only takes two lines. The next step is managing the camera's feed. We connect to preview the stream and process each frame as it comes in. This is done using a simple for in loop. And finally, after some intermediary processing to ensure the data uh, is available and in the right format, we run predictions on the input using the model and we use the process processor to transform it into something more uh, usable and semantic. Let's take a look at the small demo I made. If you have light sensitivity, please look away as the colors are quite bright and uh, might be overwhelming. The result is uh, <coughs> built and tested on my personal phone. It's an older iPhone. I recorded some sample videos while exploring the streets of Tokyo, showcasing the model's real-time object detection and classification capabilities. And uh, I have to say that uh, I can't forget that Koji was quite delicious. Next, let's dive into Google AI's Edge. Uh, it's a powerful framework. Uh, it's built to bring machine learning directly onto Edge devices. It also uses TensorFlow Lite and MediaPipe, which is a, a proprietary framework and ensures high performance and low latency. MediaPipe is quite flexible, allowing the creation of machine learning pipelines that work with different types of data, including video and audio. And the framework also uh, provides a model explore explorer, which is quite handy if you like to dig deeper. Now let's see how it looks in uh, code. For this example, I took the challenge of embedding uh, stable diffusion, uh, an older version of stable diffusion, uh, 1.5 in an older Android device, and it's running inferences uh, with it. <coughs> the API is simple. First, you instantiate the image generator, and then uh, you specify the path of the model. And finally, you use the generator to create an image and use that image to show it on the screen. 
And here you can see the result in action. I used a themed prompt. I said additional drawing, temple in background, classic Japanese landscape, cherry blossom petals floating in the breeze. And uh, on the right, you'll notice the model inference uh, running in real time for each iteration. It sped up. It took around one and a half minutes to come up with that result, but it's still impressive. And uh, honestly, I'm uh, quite impressed with the result, and I was thinking about uh, printing it and framing it. We also have a couple of runner-ups in the mobile development space. We have React Native, which is gaining momentum, and uh, it's also providing a simple and effective way to use TensorFlow Light embeddings directly when using web technologies. There's also Flutter, which uh, offers a native package for supporting TensorFlow models. And for Windows platforms, we have Windows ML, which allows developers to write machine learning workloads uh, once and automat automatically optimize performance across various hardware vendors and chips. <clears throat> if you're interested in uh, diving deeper into running AI on device, I have two major resources that I uh, personally bookmarked. Uh, I think they're really valuable, and I oftentimes find myself going back to them to review some uh, key topi topics. They're already quite popular, so some of you might already be familiar with them. First, it's the Harvard's Machine Learning System book. It's free, and all of them actually are free. You can find them online. Uh, they're fantastic because they provide a comprehensive look uh, into developing complete machine learning systems, focusing not just on model creation, but um, also on, on other practical aspects of deploying these models. And there's a dedicated section which uh, covers the nuances of deploying AI directly on devices, devices um, exploring topics like optimization performance, managing memory consumption, and exploring how uh, low power devices can be effectively harnessed. And the second research is, co is called Tiny ML, the Efficient Deep Learning Computing. This course is designed to introduce efficient AI computing techniques specifically tailored for uh, powerful deep learning applications. It's also uh, a very important research that I often find myself referring to, which I highly recommend. This is it. Thank you all for taking the time to join today's session. Uh, I hope you found it constructive. And I think we may have a couple of minutes left for questions, if there are any. Get the slides. Sorry. The slides. Yes. Yeah. Like it's not on the schedule, but I was wondering if you have a barcode or something. Sure. Okay. I will uh, provide you the slides. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a basic question about the Core ML demo. Yes. Um, so, uh, using the transformer, detection transformer, DTR. Uh, so, what kind of format of model you are running on iPhone, and is it quantized? And how much FPS you can achieve? It's it's not as performant as I, I expected initially. Uh, I've sped this up. I think the, the question you asked is how performant and how much FPS I can squeeze out of it, right? So initially, it, it, on my phone, it balanced at, at around 19 FPS. Uh, and I sped it up at 1.5. This is the result at 1.5. But I presume newer models of phones are capable of handling this at much higher speeds. My phone is an iPhone 13, and it's quite old. Um, and the, the model I used, it's uh, DTR quantized, yes. And uh, which format do you run on the iPhone? I, uh, like, is it uh, uh, TensorFlow Lite? Is it some Sir, one can you X? Please or? repeat. Can you please repeat the question? Ah, uh, the format of the model you run on the device. 
for I mean, my... Like, is it the, in, uh, the native PyTorch, or is it ONX model, or...? It's a, it's a native uh, PyTorch model, yes. Okay. Thank you. I guess that's it. Thank you very much.